Welcome to the Messiantics Podcast, a podcast about all things Messianic Judaism. Each episode, we will be sharing our opinions as we tackle some of the biggest issues in Messianic Judaism. Now, here's your hosts, Rabbis Eric, David, Jonathan, and Toby. Hey, everybody. This is Rabbi Toby with the Messiantics Podcast. I'm here with Rabbi Eric and Rabbi David and Rabbi Jonathan. And um, this week, we got... um, I think a really important question that we need to ask, uh, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, and first off, um, I am the assistant rabbi at congregation. Mayim Chaim, Daphne, Alabama. Um, I love my job. I'm so fulfilled. I'm very happy again. Thank you, Rabbi David for giving me a shot. Um, I was called into messianic Judaism back in 2005. Uh, I am not Jewish. I do not have an ounce of Jewish blood in me. As far as I know, I'm a Gentile called to a very Jewish movement. Um, my experience when I became a part of Messianic Judaism was, um, well, I didn't know anything and I was entering into a world, you know, I already knew who Yeshua was at the time he was Jesus Christ, but I knew that I had the Messiah, but something always felt like it was missing and I found it. In Messianic Judaism, I have no doubt that God called me into Messianic Judaism. Um, I, you know, I spent a lot of time learning. I didn't just run off and I didn't just buy a Talit a week after. In fact, uh, it was a good while before I felt released to get a Talit. I really wanted to know everything that I was doing, learning the liturgy, learning the Hebrew, and all those things. And all that took years. Um, but then there was another um, obstacle. Uh, a question that I would ask myself and of course uh, my rabbi at the time and others, which was, okay, I'm Gentile. What's my place here? Um, and it took me years to, to, to figure that out. And I think it took me too long to figure that out um, because I ran into some issues um, as I spent more time in the Messianic movement and would have other conversations with uh, Messianic Gentiles um, I would ask them, you know, how do you feel being a Gentile in, in, the, in, a, in a very Jewish movement? And I would get different answers. Some people are like, hey, look at, you know, God loves me just as much as the next person. And I know that I'm supposed to be here and whatever, you know. And I would talk to other Messianic Jewish believers. And I would run into two, generally two different um, opinions. One, which was, hey, look, it don't matter. You know, Jew, Gentile, God loves you. We have a job to do. We're going to do it together. But some it was, well, the Gentiles have a place, but, you know, and that created a very vicious cycle in me of self-condemnation, um, self-worth issues, of feeling like I was second class. Um, and still have conversations. In fact, one of uh, we have a very active member, uh, you know, a very dear friend of ours that goes to our congregation. And, and he told me, I think it was like last year, like, Oh, I still have moments where I feel like I'm second class. You know, I think it comes from two places. I think it can come from the insecurity of the individual. You know, it's no, no external factors. But uh, in, in almost 20 years in the Messianic movement, I have run into absolutely the Jewish pride, uh, the, the Jewish identity idolatry. Uh, I've come across three different types of rabbis. There's uh, people like Rabbi David, Rabbi Eric, which are which understand the the equality and the equal dignity and value of the Jew and the Gentile, and they let Jew and Jews and Gentiles, and particularly Gentiles, um, have um, as much access as the Jewish person as far as involvement and 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 participating in in the life cycle of the synagogue. There's the rabbis that actually, and Messianic Jewish leaders who actually place. Um, policies in their congregations that limit Gentiles. And then there's the ones that, that say what they're supposed to say, but internally they don't feel that way. You know, they say all the right things behind the Bema, but they act a different way. But they act a different way. Um, and, and what's funny is, and I'm just going to throw this out there. Um, a lot of these guys are married to Gentile women. Just want to throw that out there, which I think is so silly. Um, but, all that to say, I just wanted to share that a little bit of my, my history. And it leads to a question because the problem is is that I do run into Messianic Jewish believers who always want to talk about what Gentiles should be able to do and what they shouldn't. 
And I think we overexamine and overthink, and I think that it leads to all sorts of division and wickedness and evil, and um, not the heart of God, not the per. And and, and I think that uh, keeping Gentiles limited uh, as far as their participation because they're not Jewish, you're throwing your pri- is essentially um, not racing your prized horses because it is the Messianic Gentiles that will provoke the Jew to jealousy, the non-believing Jew. Aside from that, but I wanted to present a question, and then I'll throw it out there. Here's the question that you know we talked about. Um, how does the Messianic Jew need to operate within the Messianic movement in a way that they're fulfilling their calling, but also not stymieing Gentiles and making them feel second class? Secondly, Messianic Gentiles need to hear and need to be taught and need to be told what their equally important job is in the Messianic movement. Because here's the problem. I hear, and it's probably like 90, 10, 90%, 10%. 90% is, hey, Gentiles, remember, this is a Jewish thing. Remember, don't do this. Don't do this. You shouldn't do this. Don't culturally appropriate that. And very little is actually, Gentiles hear more about what they shouldn't be able to do and what their limits are rather than what their actual job is and what their actual calling is. We spend so much time, and I've, I've spent so many Shabbats and so much time getting beat over the head with salvations of the Jews, Israel, Jewish people, Israel, Jewish people, remember what God's coming back, remember what Yeshua was, remember what he's doing, to the point where I'm like, uh, do I matter? So I think we have a problem, you know what I'm saying? So, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to pose, you know, I'll throw that out there, you know. I have a thought. I don't know how appropriate it is, mm-hmm. but the... Um it's funny that you mentioned that there's more than one individual, if not you know, several individuals who are um, married to Gentiles. Oh, yeah. Who then also behave this way. Oh, yeah. Uh, towards Gentiles. And we're like, you know, most of us that are normal, whatever that is, would be like, okay, yeah, how do you, how are you married to someone who is the thing that you treat so less than yeah um i would be willing to posture that it's partially a theology problem particularly an Mm -hmm. american one because depending on which circles you're in in a lot of american theological circles women are seen as second class citizens Mm -hmm. by a lot so it's like how how do you how do you how are you married to someone well it doesn't matter if they're second class anyway then you know you can be married to you know, whatever, because you, you, you have an inherent understanding, a, a theology that says that women are inferior. And so it doesn't matter if they're Gentile because Gentiles and women are both inferior to you as a, as a male um, and in some of these circles as a Jew. So some right. of these people have more than one problem they're dealing with. Um, Jonathan just went for the jugular. <laughs> I'm just calling it as I see it. Right. Um, you know, I so that that's what I found mm-hmm. ironic about that because um, uh, I had not realized I hadn't really until you mentioned it I hadn't really thought about oh, yeah. that. And then in I, fact, I have a story about one uh, a, a particular uh, person that I, it, it, they they actually know that this is how their spouse feels about Gentiles and it, it, it it's a burden for them. Right. I right. can't imagine. Yeah, and I hadn't thought about that, but because you know, it, but because both ironically, both of those things are decried in the Brit Hadashah in the New Testament. They oh, are, you know, throughout the whole told, Bible. Right. Yeah. You're told, you know, you're told to, you know, husbands submit to your wives alongside wives submit to your husbands. It's male, mm-hmm. you know, men and women are equal in Messiah. Jew and Gentile are made equal in Messiah. Um, right. So again, it's not an egalitarian thing. It's a biblical thing. And I think the question we brought up, and I know Rabbi Eric wanted to say something, but I think the, the real question that we brought up in our text exchanges about this episode was, um, it, and this is going to sound like a bold statement, and I'm sure some, if there are some people, particularly Jewish people listening, they might wince at this. But the question that we po- po- uh, that we posited was, does God have a special love for Jewish people over others? And now my answer to that is no. And that might make somebody go, "What? How could you say that God doesn't have a special love for Jewish people?" Because I don't because. And, and, and my thing with that is because God's love is God's love. Right. He can't have it specially for one. How could a God who decries in, uh, uh, partiality have a special love for somebody? That's not to say that Israel doesn't have something special and unique, but it's not God's love because that's universal. So, but that. 
Yeah, as we discuss this topic, first of all, I love this topic. Yeah. It's so important for us to discuss, to, to work through to the equality of believers while having diverse roles and purposes and personalities and giftings and talents and all of those things. But one of the problems we run into is that we treat non-Jews in the Messianic movement the way the church treats the Jews in the replacement theology concept. In other words, mm -hmm. the we treat Gentiles sometimes as if they weren't God's plan. Like God had a plan for the Jewish people, but because the Jewish people didn't do everything they were supposed to, didn't do everything right, God then allowed Gentiles yeah. to become part of it. Kind of like the church says, God came to the Jews first, they rejected Messiah, so now we have the new replacement. As if Gentiles being involved in the kingdom was a, a, an afterthought, yeah. rather than God's original plan. That God's plan was always since Abraham. Or like Israel's God's wife, but Gentiles were the other woman. Right. I've actually heard a rabbi do that. Yeah, I actually said recently that too many people treat the Jews as if they were God's first wife who he hates now, who he divorced. Right. And so so Gentiles aren't a plan B. They're not an afterthought. They're not an extra. They're not outside the plan that suddenly got brought into the plan. They're none of those things. This was God's plan that Abraham would be a light to the nations and that through him all the nations would be blessed. It, it's not an afterthought or a second thought. It, in the same way that people will say, and it so frustrates me when I hear people say, you know, women can't be leaders. And then you say, well, what do you mean women can't be leaders? What about Deborah? And then they'll say, you know, Deborah was a judge of Israel. And they'll say, well, Deborah was only a judge of Israel because there weren't any men available to do that. Well, the scripture doesn't say that at Even all. Even I had that error. You corrected me, I think, in the middle of an episode on that. Even I had that wrong. Yeah. That's so, important. Yeah. Deborah wasn't the judge because there wasn't somebody or she was plan B because plan A didn't work or plan C or F or whatever. Deborah was a judge of Israel because it was God's plan for Deborah to be the judge of Israel at that time. Yeah. And, and the way we look at things is so different, you know, especially in a movement. And, and we did an episode recently on the idea or the concept of Messianic Jews wanting to be accepted by Jewishness or by Judaism. But one of the things that we do is pick and choose on those things. Because, for instance, Rabbi Akiva was a Gentile mm. who's one of the most famous rabbis of Judaism. But if Rabbi Akiva was within the modern Messianic movement— oh, We'd be calling him Pastor Akiva yeah. instead of Rabbi Akiva. Congregational leader Akiva. <laughs> instead, because... You get a certificate. But, but, Judaism, <laughs> yeah, but Judaism didn't do that. And so it's just important that we understand that, that while there are variances, differences in callings, giftings, abilities, all the things mm -hmm. that are involved in each one of us individually, Gentiles being part of the Messianic movement wasn't an afterthought or an extra. It isn't a side dish along with the main course, right. but it's God's plan initially that Jew and non-Jew would be one in Messiah. And I'm going to do it even though uh, maybe we shouldn't. Uh, my, Rabbi David wrote an excellent book, and I encourage all of our listeners to pick it up, uh, but it's called uh, the, one new man. the One New Man Revival. Revival. And it's dealing with uh, some of this topic a lot more in depth than just this topic of the role of Gentiles, because we're really now going to kind of shift, hopefully, to what Gentiles should be yeah. doing and, and all, and not just that they should be accepted. But in order to get to that point, we had to really establish yeah. that that Gentiles aren't an afterthought. It's not an extra. It's not like... Um, some people consider Gentiles like the raisins in brown sugar cinnamon. You know, brown sugar cinnamon is good enough by itself. You don't need to add raisins to right. it. it. You can live without the raisins. You, we cannot be what God intended yeah. us to be yeah. without the unity of both Jew and non-Jew in the body. And if you believe that God's heart is, well, I love Gentiles, but not like I love Jewish people. If you believe that, you're believing a lie about God and the way he is and his attributes. That's just a lie, you know, and we'll talk about, and hopefully we'll get into what, you know, I'll pass it over Rabbi David, but hopefully we'll get into uh, I, I, what is unique 
and special about Israel because there is that, and we're not taking away from that. But you're talking about the love of God, one of his universal attributes for all mankind, and you can't gatekeep that at all. Yeah, I tell people, and not, I jumped in again, but I tell people all the time that um, I love my children differently. Mm-hmm. It's just not possible for me to love both my sons. I've got great sons. I love both of them, but differently. God isn't limited by that. He loves everyone without respect of persons. He doesn't love us any less when we're doing things perfectly as when we're doing things imperfectly. Right. His love doesn't change. He may judge us differently. We may receive different things, but God's love doesn't change, and he does not love a Jewish person more than a non-Jewish person. It is impossible for him to love less. He right. only loves perfectly. Yeah, that's good. And so that's important. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, and just because we as fallen humans don't have a context to understand that doesn't mean God is limited or God's love is limited by our issues as fallen humanity, right? Um, So, you know, Rabbi Toby asked, like, what is the unique relationship Mm -hmm. or the unique calling or what have you of Israel, right? Um, I actually think that it's two part. Right. Uh, now in, in one new man revival, I focus on one specific aspect of it, but, but I think it's two part. One is, Israel was called out for the, the uh, start with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and we go to the, the, the nation of Israel, but Israel, the children of Israel. Israel was called out. The Jewish people have been called out for the distinct purpose of being a light to the nations, right? And along with that, kind of side by side with it, Israel is distinctly, the Jewish people are distinctly called to be the guardians, to be the shomrim of the oracles of God. The word of God, right? The word was given to Israel. As a matter of fact, even out of the entirety of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we know Job was a book about uh, that, that was likely written by, but definitely about somebody that wasn't Jewish. How do we know that? Because Job predates Abraham, right? We also know that many will, will say that Luke and Acts were, uh, which were written by Luke, that they were, that Luke wasn't Jewish. And so it, it was a Gentile writing this, but there's really no definitive evidence to say he wasn't. Uh, I, I, my personal thoughts on the matter, and there is a lot of research uh, that, that goes into a lot of this. My personal thoughts are at the very least, Luke was a, uh, a, a family, part of a family that had converted to Judaism, uh, that were proselytes to Judaism. But I actually think it more likely he was part of a Hellenized Jewish family. Um, and, uh, and so, because there's just too much that he knows about Judaism, Jewish history that he talks kind of point blank on throughout both letters, um, for it not to have been the case that he had some direct connection to Judaism, having grown up with it in some context. Um, but aside from that, if we look at the overarching message of the Bible, the over the, the, with exception of Job, the entire Bible was definitively written by Jewish people now inspired by the spirit of God. Right, the, the the hand of the author was inspired by the Spirit of God, but God chose to use the Jewish people to write that. Why? Not so that we can have our own books. Not so we can go. The Tanakh is the Jewish scriptures or the Hebrew scriptures or whatever. It was because we were supposed to be a light to the nations and carry that out to the nations. Right, uh, and so we are are called by God distinctly to be a light to the nations to restore creation back to what it was first created for, which is that. All of humanity, right? When God created Adam and Eve, he didn't create Jew and Gentile. He created mankind. He created humanity. And in creating mankind, uh, he created mankind in his image and likeness. And from Adam and Eve, and ultimately from Noah and his children, comes the 70 nations. From the 70 nations, God calls the smallest nation or what would become the smallest nation of uh, Israel out for the distinct purpose of being a light to the nations, of going and sharing the the burden of reestablishing an authentic relationship with the God of all creation. Not with the God of Israel, though the God of Israel is the God of all creation. It shouldn't be looked through the filter of the God of Israel solely, right? But rather the God of all creation. Uh, and uh, and so the, I, I believe, and, and Rabbi Eric, you can jump in on this also, I believe perfectly that the, the role, the distinct role of the Jewish believer is still the same. We are still called to be a light to the nations. Mm-hmm. Like Messianic Judaism, I talk about this in the book. Messianic Judaism, our 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 calling, our burden, our desires to reach our Jewish people with the good news of Messiah Yeshua. 
But as an individual Messianic Jewish person, my calling from God has not changed. I am still responsible to uphold what God called my people out to do, which is to reach the nations, right? And likewise, the nations coming into the body of Messiah have a responsibility to reach the Jewish people. Uh, and, and I think that it's, it's a cyclical necessity. It, it requires both together. Both are equal. Both have distinct roles. That doesn't mean that as a Jewish person, I can't also reach Jewish people or that as a Gentile person, you can't also reach Gentile people. Right. But we have to work in partnership together, side by side, not gatekeeping, not, oh, this is Jewish stuff. You can't do that. And this yeah. is that. And you can't do that. That's, it's just absurd. Um, one of the things that bugs me the most about the whole conversation of what Gentiles can or cannot do in a Messianic congregation is we're now – Messianic Judaism as a congregational movement is now pushing 40 to 50 years old depending on if you go solely based off when the organizational the, – the congregational organization started or when we started to see – congregations really being planted around the country. Um, so yeah, you go back about 40 to 50 years uh, of the congregational movement of Messianic Judaism. There are a few congregations like uh, uh, Adat Tikva in the Chicago area that's pushing a century old, started out as a Hebrew Christian uh, mm -hmm. congregation and, and kind of migrated with the Messianic Jewish movement from there. Uh, but generally speaking, about 40, 50 years old of the congregational movement. We have multiple generations of Gentile kids that have only ever known Messianic Jude Jewish congregations. Right. All they ever knew was Messianic Judaism, right? Who are we to say, your identity is this. This is all you've ever known. This is what you've been raised in, but you're not Jewish. I know you've been here for a long time, but you're still not good enough to since, do our thing. Since birth, quite yeah. literally. Yeah. That you're, you're still not, you're not quite there yet to do our things, right? It's just absurd to put those barriers in, and as you said, to, to gatekeep the, the word of God or a relationship with interacting in the word of God and so on. Um, so I, I'll speak first as I did to just to the, the role of the, the Jewish believer of, of, of Jews in the body of Messiah. We'll start with that uh, and then build from there. Yeah. And uh, because there is a, dis a distinct relationship that God has with Israel, but that distinct relationship is honestly, I believe, it hinges on what God called us as the Jewish people to do, mm -hmm. which is to carry him to the nations. You know, Zechariah says that there will come a time where the nations will come. There will be 10 of the, the nations that will grab a hold of the tzitzit right. of a Jewish person and say, and I'm paraphrasing here, but in essence, and every time I, I say this, every time I talk about it, I picture the little green Martian. You <laughs> know, Take me to your leader. Uh, like That's what goes through my head. Right. But you know, the, the text says that there will be 10 of the nations that grab a hold of the tzitzit of a Jew and say, I know that your God is the real God. Take me. I want to meet your God, right? Um, and the, the truth of the matter is, is I think that that 10 to 1 ratio is the foundation of what a Messianic Jewish synagogue should be. There should be 10 Gentiles for every Jewish person that either comes to faith in the promised Jewish Messiah in our congregation or that, re, that, that, that rediscovers their Jewish heritage in their already existing faith as a Jewish believer in a Messianic Jewish context. Uh, in a Messianic Jewish congregation, there should be 10 of the nations that come in and either find the promised Jewish Messiah or find the Jewish context of their relationship with the Jewish Messiah. Likewise, that text says that there will be 10 grabbing hold of the TTO, but we were four TTO. It could be as many as four to one. Uh, for 40. 40 to one, I'm sorry. It could be as many as 40 to one for all we know. Um, but bare minimum is 10 to one, right? So if you get 100 people in your congregation, if you got 100 Jews in your congregation, there should be 1,000 Gentiles, right? Bare right. minimum. There should be a thousand Gentiles, and and who in in our circles that we run in, in the Messianic Jewish movement, who in our circles would complain for a congregation of a hundred Jews? Actually, no, we all would because as Jews we complain. That's what we do. I mean, the fact um, that you've yeah. got a hundred Jews but, to even sit down in the same building together exactly. and agree on something but, is. But, but naturally, you know, Rabbi David, just want to say naturally, if you have let's say let's say you have ten Jews in a congregation and you have uh, you have uh, ten Jews and you have two hundred. Mm -hmm. um, Gentiles. Out of those 200 Gentiles, you're probably going to have many of them that are going to want to wear a tali, mm -hmm. wear a kippot, read from the Torah. So what do we do then? Some congregations will say, no, no dice. I want a bar mitzvah for my kid. No. Yeah, I was That's thinking about this, and, and uh, I was actually talking with Rabbi David about something last week that's not this, not this topic, 
But we were talking about something, and I said, you know, I never really liked that situation. I and and he said to me, yeah, you know, that doesn't really matter whether you like it or not. If God brings it about, who are we to judge what God chooses to use, to do, to give, to to be there? Um, so when we look at things like our congregation. It, who are, if if God brings a Gentile in that has the ability, the talent, the gifting, the calling, the spirit to do liturgy, then who are we to say, I know God brought them here and they have all of the requisite things to do this, but they're not Jewish, so I'm not going to let them do it. Or, uh, you know, th- those kind of things. I think it's ridiculous to, for us to, I, I think it's the height of, of arrogance Oh, yeah. for us to say, yeah, God did this, but he didn't understand. But I'm going to referee it. Right, but he didn't understand. He didn't know. Maybe maybe God didn't know they were a non-Jew when he gave them the ability to sing, to cant, to read, to do. To, you know, maybe, maybe God just didn't know. Maybe it, it bypassed him. Somebody brought him. Yeah. You know, God was looking over here, and they went over there. Well, it would be you like know, the we, Passover when God said, uh, Moses, if a foreigner wants to celebrate the Passover— have him circumcised, and he's treated like a native-born. Moses didn't say, oh, we don't need to circumcise those Gentiles, Lord. You know, you know there's there's a guy in our congregation, and you guys have similar experiences. There's a guy in our congregation named Philip um, that him and his family have been coming to CMC for six or seven years now, something like that, um, and he has probably in one of the most balanced approaches that I've seen um, kind of slowly – uh, immigrated into Messianic Jewish culture in our congregation. Yeah. yeah, and so like he came in because they felt this is where we're supposed to be. They started coming to the congregation, started getting plugged in, started being you know involved and such. But he was very intentional on if I'm going to start doing something, I want to know one that it's okay for me to do it, that it's right for me to do it, and two how to do it the right way. Uh, so that it doesn't create offense, it doesn't cause problems, it doesn't whatever. But over the years, he has become. Like, for instance, he led the uh, he, he serves on our, our Hazanim team leading liturgy and such. He while we were at the Southeast Regional, Rabbi Toby and I were both away for the conference. He led our entire Torah service, read from the scroll and everything. And it was his first time getting to read from the scroll um, as a Gentile person in a Messianic Jewish congregation. He has very intentionally strove to have more reverence to the procedurals of the Torah service than most messianic rabbis that i know um like i've seen and and i won't name names but i have seen messianic rabbis even in recent months who led torah service looking like they've never stepped in one before and they were trying to read the directions in the siddur as they went through on what the next phase was the next step was the next thing was uh because they 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 just appeared like they had zero clue what was happening uh and what was supposed to go on um, but here is, and these are, are Jewish people that have done this their entire life, right? And here's Philip, who's who's not Jewish, who loves the Jewish people, who loves the Messiah of Israel, who loves his Messianic Jewish congregation, and has very intentionally strove to to uh, uh, put himself in a position where when he does represent the congregation, mm-hmm. he's doing so with reverence to the tradition, with reverence to how it's done properly, with reverence to making sure that he's he, you know, he he's not opening up the Torah scroll and just like throwing the dice and hoping that nobody's going to be able to call him out on pronouncing something wrong. Right. But he's actually working and practicing and, right. and making sure he's ready. Um, you know, Rabbi Toby uh, taught himself how to lane Torah. And uh, the first time he ever read from the Torah scroll, he laned the, the Torah. I, I don't even know how to do that. I wasn't raised uh, and, and trained in laning Torah. And so him, he got up and laned Torah and, and had taught himself how to, that for those that aren't, that he canted the Parsha. He, he learned the trope and, and how to sing the trope of the, the Torah uh, and, and did it his very first time reading from the Torah scroll. Uh, was able to to uh, sing the trope of, of Torah and did a phenomenal job with it, um, and had reverence in how he approached it and 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 how he did it. As he'll do it again this Saturday, actually. Um, yeah, there's so, a, there's almost a fear, you know. Unfortunately, too much of uh, Messianic Judaism operates in fear over some things. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's almost a fear that if a Gentile reads from the Torah, 
that it will like it's it's almost like a zero sum game that if we let them do it it it's taking away like some jewishness from the from the font right and and so instead it's, of you know like there's only so tainted. much well no not tainted yeah, but yeah. it's it's like there's only so much judaism yeah and if we let a gentile read from the torah they're getting some of our judaism right. and and that and and but we don't think of it if if, if all four of us sit down to eat matzo ball soup. That doesn't make Toby and Rabbi Toby and Rabbi Jonathan Jewish, no. and it doesn't make Rabbi David and I less Jewish, right? Because they did something that is identifiably Jewish in in culture. And likewise, if if Rabbi Jonathan reads from the Torah, it doesn't take some of my Jewishness or anybody else's Jewishness, nor does it make him Jewish. Yeah, he doesn't gain. Jewishness. He doesn't gain Jewishness, and I don't lose Jewishness. But God gains worship and praise. Yeah, so I saw a video a while back. Uh, what do you mean? It was a couple of weeks ago. Um, of a, uh, a Chabad. I don't, I don't know that he was necessarily a rabbi. I'm pretty sure he was, but I'm not not 100 percent sure. But a Chabad uh, Lubavitch follower. Uh, who was talking about what's happening in Israel with the the current war with Gaza and everything that's going on there, uh, or particularly with Hamas uh, and, and everything that's happening there, and with the the fact that there are so many, especially Christian believers, but so many Gentiles in general around the world that are standing in support of Israel right now, and he said, he said, you know. Uh, if you don't, and this is somebody that's not a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, right? This is a, a somebody that that follows Chabad Judaism, uh, which or Chabad Lubavitch Judaism, which is a, an ultra orthodox uh, form of Judaism. He said, uh, you know, uh, if if you don't believe that the Messiah is coming soon, you're not paying attention. He said Judaism has always believed that when the Messiah comes, that he will turn the heart of the nations to Torah and to Israel, the Jewish people. And what we're seeing happen all around us is the nations turning their heart to Torah and to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is the sign that the Messiah is coming. And here we are as Messianic believers, as, as Messianic Judaism, for 2,000 years now. We have the whole playbook. Yeah, we, we, we literally are living out. We, we believe the Messiah has come. The Jewish Messiah has come, right? And, and Judaism has always believed, and we believe it because it's what the, the Tanakh says, the, the Old Testament says, is that when Messiah comes, that the hearts of the nations will turn to Torah, that he will turn, they will turn to the, the Jewish people, to Israel, turn to Torah. Messianic Judaism is the prime example that that is what happens, right? right? Because as Messianic Judaism grows, more and more Gentiles feel a burden on their heart to turn back to the, for, for lack of a better way of wording it, the, the, more, authentic. The, the more authentic, the original form of what the body of Messiah really was. Um, and in doing so, their heart is drawn to living out to, to the best that they can. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and most importantly, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, not because their rabbi or, or Joe Schmo on YouTube said you have to do this or you're not really a believer, but because the Spirit of God that inspired the words to begin with is now active and, and, and transformative in their lives and is drawing them mm -hmm. in this direction. We very literally are the answer. Right. As a matter of fact, uh, Rabbi Eric has had people from the local Jewish community that have visited uh, Bridam for high holy day services and such and, and said things akin to, and, and you can better paraphrase how it was actually worded, but something akin to Bridam may be the last true uh, example of authentic Judaism in the area because this is, you know, we, we've all been waiting for the nations to, for Gentiles to come and participate. And here it's actually happening Jew and Gentile participating together. It doesn't happen to the conservative synagogue, it doesn't happen the reform synagogue it doesn't happen at chabad the same way it's happening here um and, and that's a powerful statement when when the non-believing jewish world is able to see what the messianic jewish world isn't even willing to open our eyes up to right like like if they're going hey this is where it's happening at this is authentic and they're not quite like they're almost there but they're not quite seeing that it's because of yeshua right but they're they're seeing that what they believe the Messiah will do is happening. But then we as Messianic Judaism, the representation 
of Messiah, uh, and we're not able to see that, or we refuse to, which is probably more honest and accurate, is we refuse to, right? If we're gatekeeping stuff, and this goes back to our conversation on on where we're seeking validation from, right? Because honestly, most, and I think you may have even mentioned this, Rabbi Toby, earlier, most Messianic rabbis that, that I've heard that have talked against Gentiles' participation in uh, uh, Torah observancy, in, uh, synagogue, life in cycle. synagogue life cycle, and so on and so forth. Their reasoning isn't, this isn't for Gentiles too, or the Gentiles should never do this. The reasoning is, we don't want Jews to come in and fill out a place. We don't want non-believing Jews to or come in. Or not tell and, the difference between a yeah, Jew and a Gentile. Yeah, and and the reality is, is it goes back to that conversation. Are we seeking validation in the Jewish community, or have we found our validation in Messiah? It, yeah. Right? Or have we found our validation in Messiah? Because if it's about Messiah, then who cares if the, the traditional Jews yeah. are not happy with us? They're not happy with us already. What difference is a couple of Gentiles wearing Tali Tote going to make a difference, make, make when it comes yeah. to it? It's not going to change. If we go and yank all the Tali Tote off of everybody in our congregation that's not Jewish, is it going to change the Jewish world's opinion of us? No, because we still believe in Yeshua. So what difference does it make? Why are we creating these barriers that don't need to exist, that are, are, are idiotic, that are causing more problems, that are driving? I've said this before, and I'll say it time and time again because it rings so true. The two-house Hebrew roots, whatever yeah. you want to call it, movement, would not still have the ground that it has today if authentic Messianic Judaism did not treat Gentiles like second-class citizens in the body of Messiah. Mm -hmm. We push Gentiles away. Gentiles who have a legitimate heart and calling from the Lord that fill the presence of the Spirit of God, drawing them into Messianic Judaism. They are looking for the most authentic expression of faith in Yeshua that they can find. They come to us, and then we push them away because they're not Jewish enough, or because they're not good enough, or because they're not one of us. They're not in the in club, or whatever else. We push them away, and then as we're pushing them away, what what, what do you think is going to happen? They're looking for validation for the call that they fill on their life, and we're not providing them the, the, the atmosphere where they can find that validation and what God is actually doing in their lives. So where do they go? They go to the people that will give them that validation. The angry people that are already mad because they felt the same thing 20, 30 years ago and we haven't fixed it. And we're quick to write white papers about all these issues that we don't like. My wife, I, God, my wife is one of the wisest people I know. And how she ended up marrying me, I don't know. Cause, but but my wife has this state, this thing that she says, and we've, we've dealt with this a few times in our congregation. She has this thing that she, that she says, if we spend all of our time talking about the things that we're against, when is anybody going to ever know what we're for? Right. Right. Sure. And, and that's the thing here is like, we spend all this time talking about all this stuff we don't want Gentiles to do. Or, or, or How are they going to know what they're supposed to exactly. do? Exactly. What's funny to me about this last part of the conversation where we're talking about, you know, the uh, <clears throat> really that Messianic Judaism is kind of at fault for the Hebrew Roots movement existing um, as it exists today. Yeah, uh, well, I wouldn't necessarily say at fault for it existing as it is today, but we we have perpetuated the problem. Yeah, part the, of problem the problem sure. was already there. We could have squashed it if we had handled it right. Sure, but it could have it could have ceased existing yeah. a good 20 yeah. years ago. But know? we do have culpability in the fact that it is still existing and still right. growing. What What's funny to me about that whole thing is it it's... It almost is a direct, um, the I'm trying to think of how to word this the right way. The it is a direct um, effect of denying uh, Gentiles to act in a way that supports the Messianic Jewish movement mm -hmm. in the world today, and realistically in the world for the last several hundred years. The biggest stopgap between the Jewish community and anti-Semitism has been and continues to be Gentiles. Um, so much so that Israel today has um, a, memor a memorial to the righteous of the nations who stood in the gap between the Jewish people and anti-Semitism, particularly in the Holocaust, but elsewhere in the world during other pogroms and um, atrocities carried out by uh, governments or groups uh, against the Jewish people. And so, you know, and, and today that is one of the things. That is one of the biggest things that you can be as a Gentile in the Messianic Jewish movement is you can be the voice that speaks up against. And I'll, 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 again, because anti-Semitism is like, it's a broad brush. 
anti-Jewish rhetoric, anti-Jewish behavior. You are the you are the biggest. Um, you can be you can be the biggest obstacle to those who hate the Jewish people. Um, as a Gentile, yeah, you're also the, the. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just, you can you can be the biggest obstacle to those who hate the Jews. Yeah, and you can speak up against it. You can fight against it in a way that the Jewish people themselves um, can't or wouldn't be able to in the world um, as it as it has existed and as it exists. Yeah, and you're getting into what I think is the other great big part of our discussion because what what you're saying is is that. But by diminishing a Gentile's participation, you're also getting rid of your sharpest tool for Jewish evangelism. You are. Yeah. Absolutely. I will tell you that I will not think the Messianic movement has become what God intends it to be until I no longer hear a Gentile say, I wish I was Jewish. Oh, my God. And not because I don't think that you know what in saying that yeah. it's it, when Gentiles don't feel like they're not a part of something unless they were Jewish. When when they understand that they're equally welcome and equally part of the community while being Gentile. Uh, when 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 no one comes up to me because I, I I cannot tell you the number of times people have come up to me and said, "Man, I wish I was Jewish." Man, and, and what, every what time we make the, every time we make the joke, well, you know what Tevye said, you know, I, you know, you chose us. Why couldn't you choose someone else once around? We we always reply with some kind of a joke about, well, being Jewish isn't all what it's made out to be, or. Or, yeah, you get to be the one that's hated by more people in the world than any other group of people or, or whatever response. But the reality is I just want there to be a time when we can have Jewish and non-Jewish people worshiping together in unity without either one feeling less than. You know, when, when, uh, when I first came to faith, I came to faith in a Christian church. And immediately I was raised up as something special because I was a Jewish person who accepted Yeshua. And uh, so there was that kind of strangeness. And in in the Messianic movement, I I can't wait for the day when Gentiles are a part of our community and feel equal to the point where they don't feel like they're missing something because they don't have the special sauce. Yeah, because they're not Jewish, right? Well, but what I was saying, the reason, and what I was saying, the reason why uh, Messianic Gentiles are your sharpest tool for evangelism, that's just, that's not just my idea. That's what Paul said would happen. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he said that Messian, he said that Gentiles would provoke the Jew to jealousy. Now, I'm telling you, what I'm saying is, uh, I think it's obvious that what's going to provoke a Jew to jealousy uh, quicker Um a Gentile that goes to church and just talks about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, or if they see a guy laning the Torah, uh, leading liturgy, um, doing a drosh, wearing a tallit, and he's a Gentile. Yeah, when you talk about jealousy, what is jealousy? If somebody flirts right. with your wife, Rabbi Toby, I'm not going to be jealous because <laughs> that's your wife, not right. my wife. Right. If he flirts with my wife, then I'll become jealous. And until we understand that in order for Jewish people to be jealous, they have to see people loving what they believe is theirs. Yes. In such a way that it causes them to react because of that. And you can't have that in a congregation that doesn't allow non Jewish people yeah. to fully participate in those things which would cause Jewish people to be jealous. I know many, many more Jewish believers that were led to Messiah by non-Jewish people than by Jewish people. Many, many more. Mm. It's almost like that's how you know the Bible said it would happen. Yeah. Crazy. Right. Well, and I will. It's crazy. And part of part of the one of the big reasons for that is too is not just the um, not just things like Gentiles keeping Shabbat or you know being in a Torah service, which those things can be a part of, of course. Yeah. But it's it's the fact that you know one of Judaism's biggest tenets today, biggest beliefs, biggest principles, is to is the repair of the world, to make the world a better place. To clean and, along. Um, yeah, than it already is. That that it's part of God's purpose in having you here while you were born, and you know 
if you read just some of the biographies of some of the people who are in, um, I forget the Hebrew name for the garden in Israel, the righteous of the nations, um, righteous among the nations. Uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. That. Yeah, yeah. But like, you know, many of them, many of them Christians mm-hmm. who were absolute lights to not just the Jewish people, but in the end to the world. And, and, and so, you know, Jewish people don't just see the outward acts of obeying many of the commandments, but they see the bigger part of what God expects of us, which is faith, mercy, justice, mm-hmm. you know, th- those things that are, are brought about. And they see that in someone who believes in God and they go, and, and they go, man, why, why are you this way? And that happens often in the Christian world. Imagine how much more can happen. Yeah. Oh, with it does. Gentiles participating in the Messianic, and, fully in the Messianic Jewish world. And, and the garden for the record that you're talking about is it's at Yad Vashem. That's what which I'm is at, yeah, the yeah, Holocaust yeah. Memorial in right. in Jerusalem, and what's really intriguing is it's at the Holocaust Memorial. They don't go, okay, they're righteous ones of the nations. We're going to put them down the street, and when you get done here, we'll tell you where you can go to find them. It's included in the same site that we're memorializing the Jewish people who lost their lives and the right. the many many non Jews. I mean, millions of non Jews that lost their lives in the Holocaust right. as well. Right. Um, and, and so the righteous of the nations are, are memorialized in that same site. It's not a whole separate thing that we're over. Oh, they're Gentiles. They can't be a part of this. Yeah. Part of what I was getting at earlier was, you know, when we, um, with, with in regards to the Hebrew roots movement and everything, when we restrict Gentiles participation in kind of being, reaching their full capacity of who they could be. And we, 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 we push that away. And like you said, that they go away. They will find a place where they're comfortable and can live out their calling in full as much as they can find. And the Hebrew roots world is a, it's a wild, wild west. So it is, a, it is an open environment in which they can perceivably grow and live in uh, the calling they feel on their lives. And ironically, rather than becoming Gentiles who stand in the gap between anti-Semitism and the Jewish people, ironically, they end up doing the opposite. Because the Hebrew roots world is rife with conspiracy theories and anti-Jewish thought and rhetoric and hate. Um, And I I say that as someone who came out of the Hebrew roots movement, who was there. And I heard all those things. I saw all those things. I read all those things. I still do. And, you know, they become the people who begin speaking on those things. And, And most conspiracy theories have some kind of root in Jewish hatred, hatred for Jewish families, hatred for Jewish people. Um, hatred, you know, Christ killers, you know, as, mm-hmm. they, as they say, you know, it's, and so that it, it's when you take away something or when you keep someone from becoming who God is bringing them to be, they will do something and they right. end up doing yeah. the opposite of what they could right. have done. And, mm-hmm. and yeah. you play a role in that. Yeah, I think in, in summary, what is the role of a Gentile or a non-Jew within the Messianic movement? It's to love God. And love Israel in such a way that encourages Jewish non-believers and Gentile non-believers to join them in loving God and loving Israel. And all the rest of it, because a a non-Jew can go to an Orthodox synagogue and see Kippot and Tzitzit and Tanakh and Hebrew and all that. What makes it different is that they're introduced to Yeshua and to in that supernatural yep. connection. And the outcrop of that, the outgrowth of that is a desire for them to participate in worship along with their Jewish brothers and sisters. And uh, so that's the role. The role is, and in each community, that role will be different because there are Messianic communities that do almost no liturgy. So in that congregation, a Gentile wouldn't become a cantor. Because in that community, it's not a thing. It's not right. part of it. Other congregations, they do a full Shabbat service and with liturgy and Torah service and procession and all this. And in that community, they should fully participate yeah. in every part of it. They should be part of the worship team. They should be part and parcel of the Shabbat school, of the nursery, of the youth program, of everything going on, depending on the community. Yeah. I just want to say that I'm blessed to be, and I'm coming from a place, if you're listening, I'm blessed to be a part of a congregation that, you know, 
Rabbi David and uh, Rabitz and Danny, they've built a beautiful congregation that reflects the heart of God like, you know, I've never seen. And I know that you guys feel the same way about the one new man, Jews and Gentiles. I'm just saying I couldn't imagine being in a situation where David, Rabbi David, led his congregation, didn't allow Gentiles to bar mitzvah, didn't allow Gentiles to do tally. So let's just imagine I go to CMC and that's how David's doing it. And I witness to a Jewish guy, and he becomes a believer, and he comes to synagogue. His kids can bar mitzvah. Mine can't. Do you see how it's so, that way of looking at things in our movement is so untenable? It's just so untenable, you know? It, it, to me, it, it's just—and again, please understand, as we're sitting here saying this, none of what we're talking about is ever going to make a non-Jewish person Jewish or a Jewish person oh. non-Jewish. Nope. That is not what we're talking about. I opened about. saying I'm not an ounce yeah. Jewish. But what we're talking about is this unique unity that God has created between Jew and non-Jew where we walk side by side, hand in hand, together in the same direction, serving the same God, following the same tenets of his word together in unity without uh, a need to, for, for one to become something they're not either way. And, and so it's so important for us to understand that. Depending on what congregation you're in, if you're Jewish, use your giftings and talents to the best of your ability to serve God and serve your community. Mm-hmm. Love God, love man. If you're non-Jewish, use your giftings and abilities to the best of your talent and abilities to love God, to love and serve your community, loving God, loving your neighbor. And look for open doors for that. And and we as the messianic movement need to step out of God's way yeah. and allow him to raise up those he chose to serve. Remembering that Caleb and Joshua led Israel into the promised land and Joshua was a Jew, an Israelite, a Hebrew, and Caleb was a Kenizzite. His father was a Kenizzite. So we have one Jew one non-Jew leading the children of Israel into the promised land. And when we understand that, when we line up with that, we're going to see the power of God fall in a way we've never seen. I look for the day when no one comes up to me and says, Rabbi, I really wish I was Jewish. So uh, I want to read this. This is uh, Paul's words in Ephesians 2 and speaks directly into this. And, And I think this is a good place to to wrap this episode up uh, with, with leaving you a little something to ponder uh, directly from Scripture, Ephesians two seventeen, And he came and proclaimed shalom to you who are far away and shalom to you who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by the same Ruach. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. You have been built on the foundation made up of the emissaries and prophets, with Messiah Yeshua himself being the cornerstone. In him, the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple for the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into God's dwelling place in the Ruach. And so with that, we want to leave you uh, this episode and uh, encourage you, if you have any comments, any thoughts, any questions, please feel free to drop those in um, wherever you find this at. If it's on your uh, you know, Spotify or iTunes or what have you, uh, on our social media, send us a, a note. Let us know what your thoughts are and, uh, and how you feel, and uh, we would love to hear from you. And if this has been a blessing and a help, share it with other people. Help us out to spread the word. Thank you for listening to the Messy Antics podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. And be sure to follow and interact with us on social media at Messy Antics Podcast.